Okay. Well, thank you everyone for um, lively discussions. Janelle and I were popping into the different breakout uh, group rooms and heard a lot of really good discussion. Um, okay, so we're gonna try something, which is to go through all of the breakout group recommendations and I see people still typing, so we'll see how this goes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen and I have all of the links here um, to the different breakout group recommendation slides. So I'm gonna share, and as I mentioned, we're gonna start with group eight. And so if um, you all could be ready, am I sharing the right thing? Are you seeing group eight, the Google slides? Yes, Lucy. Okay. All right, so why don't we go ahead and start with um, group eight um, and let's try and keep this the report box to two minutes. So um, Laura, are you ready? I am, but I didn't have my audio switched on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me go first. Um, yeah. So yeah, there were um, we were a small group, um, but there were a couple of things that we focused on. So one is that we talked about uh, when we're defining genetic similarity. You know, there are a lot of different tools available, and they give different results. And so one thing that um, would be really useful is to have a kind of unifying analytical tool that would maybe run the your samples um, using multiple methods at the same time and give some kind of unifying result or some way that you could integrate um, the results from the, the different um, the different packages. Um, and the other thing we talked about was the, the need to define um, uh, the um, social determinants of health and to define what the key determinants are for reporting. Um, and bearing in mind that those may not be available in all cohorts. Um, so, but, but to have a kind of either a standard format or, or an ontology or just um, a kind of a list of key um, features to report, um, we could see what is is and isn't been um, included in a particular analysis. So it's as important to know what's not been considered as is, um, as what has been considered. So hopefully that's um, that's a good summary of what we discussed. Great, thank you so much. And I apologize; these are these are kind of the screen views. I, I couldn't figure out how to do the slide sharing and then do all the tabs. So um, let's move. So um, group one and two ended up combining. So thank you to Sarah and Ian for their flexibility. Um, is there who's reporting back for group? I guess it's group two. Yeah, I think we we're going to do a fun combined approach. If that's all right. Give me just a second to share. Oh, you have. Slides. Oh, yeah, Never I have mind. it. Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, this is your slide. Uh, hopefully, um, go ahead. Yep. Okay. Um. So our group was focused on uh concerns of meta analysis of legacy and non legacy genomic data, um, and we came up with three somewhat shakily worded recommendations, uh, with the first one being to carefully consider trade-offs between power and participant exclusion when using more granular strata or defining strata. Um, oftentimes when we sort of use more granular groupings, um, there are power issues. Um, often when we use less granular groupings, there's also the concern of sort of individuals or study participants being excluded. Sarah? Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, so the second recommendation is that um, if you do find heterogeneity in the meta-analysis meta results, um, that it's important to investigate the sources of heterogeneity. We notice that might not always be um, easy to do. Um, I think it might be supposed to be describe the sources, but we'll double check that wording. Um, the the third recommendation was about clearly defining, describing, and justifying how you're um, creating the strata for the meta-analysis, whether those are based on genetic inference or non-genetic labels, um, and, and to justify how you're defining those strata and assigning participants to them. Um, we talked a bit about you know, the reasons people do meta-analysis often being to account for population structure, in which case these strata should be based on genetic inference, but we realized there might be um, other types of descriptors used to to group into strata. So we just said it's important to um, articulate that and to justify those analytical decisions. And I think that was it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Let's see if I can get this back out of slide view. Oh, good. Okay, so if I do this and then 
slideshow. I think this should be group um, three. And Emer Kenny, that's yours. Sorry, took me a second to unmute. Okay, great. So um, I'll just confess, we didn't get to, we, we were a group of about 20. We didn't get to actually review these recommendations together because we, we were still uh, discussing, uh, but thank you to Rob uh, for putting these together. So I just want to highlight that, um, that you know, there, there are certain differences about the utility of uh, population descriptors and legacy data for reference genome resources. These are, these are a little bit different than um, most of the other questions because these are often open access, open science resources that are designed not as studies, but as resources to support study with very, very broad future use. And um, uh, a lot of our conversation in our breakout group was around uh, the question about and the importance of or need for uh, harmonization. Um, and um, there were some stated utility for needing to harmonize around group labels, for example, for looking at uh, uh, questions of allele frequency, things that can't be done at an individual level, but other questions uh, about whether or not you need an individual label or population label to generate a, a reference genome, for example. Um, I think something important that came across was understanding how uh, the legacy data uh, developed the population descriptor, if there were due diligence and community outreach that had been done, and, um, and maintaining that uh, to some degree, acknowledging um, the challenge of then combining data across uh, multiple projects. Um, and there, there was a plurality of, of uh, thoughts all the way from um, perhaps we don't need descriptors to uh, maintaining uh, descriptors that have this feature of have been developed in concert with community outreach uh, to perhaps even the need for multidimensional labels to account for open, uh, broad future research applications. Perfect. Thank you. That was two minutes on the dot. Um, let's see. The next group is group number four. Um, let's see, uh, this is the necessity of gen non-genetically inferred labels. So um, Anna, is there something I should be showing? Do you want me to show the other slide? Uh, or do you have something yeah, you'd like to discuss? The, the link is slide five, uh, Lucy. Oh, it's slide five. Okay, thank you. Let yeah. me slide show this. Okay. Thanks. So our yeah. group was thinking but about was not thinking about any labels that we might add to data that are non-genetically inferred, that are genetically inferred, and just focusing on population descriptors that live with data that are not genetically inferred. And we were wondering um, around the challenge of harmonization, i.e. if you've got two different data sets which are using two different sets of labels, like to what extent and when would you need to smush them together and harmonize those labels at any stage of your research process. Um, and uh, we were first of all talking about use cases that were not in the NASAM list. And we were noting that understanding who is included in the production of knowledge um, is, is one potential use case here. And indeed, both the NIH and the FDA have diversity reporting requirements. And uh, an opportunity for impact is perhaps discussions around them, around for those, they currently for really focus on the OMB um, categories, but um, particularly with the move from one set of OMB categories to the next that was announced earlier this year, maybe there's a good opportunity for us to weigh in uh, there. And another thing that um, was brought up was also on the output of genomics research, not just thinking about understanding health disparities, but thinking about the ways in which our research uh, impacts people differentially. Um, pot potentially sort of smushing um, might be important in some cases uh, there. But we, we overall agreed that harmonization and sort of lumping together of these non-genetically inferred labels is hardly ever needed. Um, so for example, table one, Descriptive statistics for who's in your data, like show the granularity. We think that's a clear should be a clear recommendation. Don't don't lump. 
and um and the the sort of usual usual excuse given for lumping which is we need the power like we should have more thinking about whether we're getting a well powered answer to a poorly um justified question um as somebody yeah. pointed out Mildred pointed out that um there's that's coming up in peer review opportunities to push back against that um could we have some more scope for uh, for for that kind of process to be um uh, happening more broadly um, if there's more than anyone else oh. want to quickly jump in or there we go. Maybe you could put it in the chat. People could put it in the chat. I, um, I'm going to try and move us along just to keep on time, but I think we will have a chance so people know to revisit some of this, um, tomorrow we'll have more, a little bit more time for the breakout group. So if you have things that are, um, yet to yet to chime in, you can, you can, um, save it, save it for tomorrow if you could. Okay. So the next uh, breakout group is uh, led by AJ Jenkins, uh, Jenkins Jackson. Sorry. Um, let's see. Do I have the right? Yeah. Okay. I think is this your slide? Yes, it is. And what okay. Is Thank you. Jenkins thing. Why did Why does everyone go to Jenkins instead of Jackson? I'm I, so sorry. My apologies. No, 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 no worries. It is literally a common thing. Um, okay. So we talked about prioritizing multiple descriptors in this context. And so we have four recommendations for you. First, strongly consider whether you have to categorize. If that is not even necessary, then why are you doing it? Please don't do it because your colleagues did it, because your mentor taught you to do it, or whatever the case may be. Pause, use your own scientific gut and determine if this is necessary. If you do choose to, it is mandatory to admit the historical context, complexity, and variety of the descriptors. Next, do not use population descriptors to infer anything individualized, whether that's an individual outcome or a risk factor. Here, the best indicator would be the individual's lived experience, what they are communicating, they've gone through, they've survived, or even how they articulate their cultural practices. All of those particular things from that individual, not from the group, would be your best indication here. Next, we recommend becoming competent in the history of these descriptors so that it's well understood how to use them because they overlap a lot in the way historically people have been categorized by culture, by race, ancestry, ethnicity, geography, uh, and social determinants of health exposure. So to really disentangle what you're using, learn this history. And then next, consider using structural and social determinants as your predictor variables in your analyses. Sometimes you can use these as your moderators to see if these exposures are making things worse. Um, I, I often don't recommend statistically using this as mediators because the way our sampling structure is set up in these data sets where you often won't prove there's any mediation because you don't have enough. Um, but in a perfect world, yes, you could use these as, as mediators. And then center all your population descriptors in the colonial context, because that is where we get these groupings from and where the subsequent disproportionate exposures come from. Team, anything else you want to mention? Or throw in the chat if you don't have a chance to. Great job. Thank you so much. Um, let me get the slides for the next one. So here's group six, and that is um, Jen Wojcik. Yeah, so we um, spent a fair amount of time talking about how you actually get to the other label, how there's very many reasons why someone would be categorized as other. It could be from missingness, from membership in multiple groups, from membership into a group that's not represented in one of the major buckets of data. Um, and so just sort of acknowledge that um, complication and how we group people. Uh, a lot of the conversations was about, you know, learning from the lessons of the past moving forward. And so our, when our first recommendation is maybe not as helpful for the legacy data, but I think for any kind of, you know, using of legacy data, creation of new descriptors to encourage the collecting of more detailed information and not dropping it when the data is uh, shared. So. What values did the multiple people check? Obviously, balancing it with um, issues of concern for privacy. Uh, there was also discussion about the use of the word "others" in general and how it's sort of exclusionary and and um, 
detrimental way of looking at people as others, right? It's literally othering them. And so instead to use terms uh, that are more relevant to what actually uh, is going on in terms of whether they're missing or it's unknown or the remaining for a clustering, uh, but to sort of have more clarity of that. And that sort of feeds into the, the NASM recommendations about more precision in what you're describing as so the methods and specific research question. Um, and then sort of at a, at a more conceptual level, this idea that if possible, to design studies that negate the use of them, uh, the other category entirely by using methods that don't require these discrete groupings. I think this goes really in line with previous um, conclusions and recommendations from the other groups earlier in terms of, you know, why do you need to categorize, um, questioning that. Uh, and that includes discussions about, you know, if you are doing a particular reason and it's essentially an exclusion criteria, then just state it as such, right? Is other just um, an exclusion criteria by another name, right? And so to keep that in mind, I think my two minutes are up. Thank you. All right, thank you. And let's see, if we move on to the next group. This is the group on admixed populations. I think this is um, Chris Genius. See, do we have Chris? Uh, can you all hear me? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Hi. No worries. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, we had a great discussion, and, and certainly there's some overlap um, with the, the previous topic. Um, so one of the things, and, and certainly there were challenges in, in terms of how you know how populations were were labeled, and it seemed like there was a need to think about sort of handling more complex scenarios of admixture, thinking about the continuous aspects of genetic ancestry a little bit more, um, even in uh, populations of, of mixed ancestry, um, and to account for the fact that there's complexity and that there's differences and that these aren't sort of monolithic sort of reference data sets on their own. Um, and then another in reporting was the question of um, sort of where, when, and why people are assigned to be in um, in certain groups or, or clusters, um, why specific groups were chosen for a specific analysis and what the goals of that specific analysis and what the goal of that grouping for that specific analysis was. Um, so there were a lot of other topics in our group. It was kind of hard to uh, condense things down if anyone else has any uh, additional contributions they want to throw in. OK. Cool. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay. Next group. Come on. There we go. Um, we're on to group number nine, um, Audrey Hendricks. Hi, thank you. Uh, we had a great discussion as well. Really um, grateful for everyone who joined. So uh, I was just going to break this into the current method. So for individual level data, the most commonly used approach was very similar to NOMAD discussed earlier, identify some form of genetic similarity, and then use some kind of classifier, for instance, random forest. Um, there was some discussion of some other techniques that have been used like AI or neural networks, but that was prone to overfitting. And for summary level data, it was more mixture methods um, to identify mixture proportions. There were several gaps that were identified. Uh, and so there was a really great point that a lot of the studies and legacy data were gathered under certain ascertainment schemes. And so we need new methods and techniques to account for these ascertainment schemes and how they're tangled up with genetic similarity and, and so on. Um, we wanna capture a lot of these methods are sensitive to the reference data used. And so if we could develop methods that capture reference data coverage or lack thereof or are less sensitive to that would be helpful. Or could we um, somehow bring forward genetic similarity uh, in maybe a less dense type of way? 
Um, and then lastly, take home that I always like to think about is we want to think about the research question first. Do we need a grouping or can we retain or use genetic similarity? Um, and of course, we want to make sure that we actually want genetically driven population descriptors and not some other, um, you know, SDOH variable or something. So being very thoughtful. Great. Thank you. Um, let's get the next group up here. And this is group 10, Elena Gunayam. Hi there, everyone. Uh, special shout out to Lainey, my partner in crime who helped develop these recommendations. Um, so the first thing that we uh, our first recommendation we had was for researchers, authors, funders, publishers, or others who might be um, trying to monitor diversity to consider and state their goal when striving to monitor diversity. Um, often equity is an overarching goal, and that was uh, that concept was kind of taken pretty directly from the J4GH diversity and data sets policy. Um, so I encourage you to go and look at that document if you haven't yet. Um, so kind of sub questions to kind of illustrate what we mean by this. Is the goal to measure whether um, you are being inclusive from a race and ethnicity standpoint? Um, are you trying to say that you are representative of the US population from a race ethnicity standpoint? Um, or might your goal instead be to measure whether you're adding uniqueness to a genomic data resource from a uh, genomic standpoint? And then the second recommendation was um, aimed at secondary users of legacy data. Uh, this might also be catalogs or databases that are using existing data from lots of different places. And the recommendation is to describe limitations that they face in knowing how and which population descriptor concept was actually measured in a given legacy data set as well as limitations they face um, when reanalyzing data as an attempt to strive to monitor diversity. For example, limitations when um, just based on what available data reference genomes there are and the labels that, that are used in them. Thanks, Lucia, that's our summary. Great, thank you. And let me get the next group up. Everyone's doing a really good job keeping the time, by the way. You're making my job easy. Um, okay, so next we have group 11, uh, Jean Cadigan. Hi, yes, we were the avoiding misuse of labels group. And thanks to Xander Aguelo for being a fantastic note taker um, and the, the other members of this group. I think that uh, one thing that's coming out as we get further along in this process are such nice areas of overlap um, between the recommendation of the recommendations between um, the groups. So what we talked about um, and came up with is that we, we felt it essential to ensure that the legacy data is appropriate given its use of labels for addressing the specific research question of interest um, and that when doing that, um, inappropriate inclusion of the data so that legacy labels collected under different kinds of um, sociocultural context that were appropriate at, at a certain time should outweigh the need for um, just getting a larger sample size for your study. And then our next recommendation was that um, if labels are to be used in um, legacy, if labels used in legacy data are aggregated with newer labels, then there needs to just be transparent um, uh, rationale, methods for how these groupings were aggregated. Um, you need to put them in papers, uh, preferably not in a supplement, but, but in the main text, recognizing that um, journal editors have um, funny, funny rules, but, but pressing on journal editors um, could be one of our, our goals too. Thanks. Thank you. Get the slides up for the next group. Okay. Group 12, Katrina Claw. Yeah, thank you, Lucia. Um, we had a great discussion, and thank you to our note taker, Spree. Um, 
So we talked about use of legacy data with ambiguous consent. Um, we said that creating an expiration date for the continued use of legacy data and biospecimens should be considered. Um, and our other recommendation was to for everyone to evaluate whether the use of a contemporary data set that was not as ambiguous would be useful in your study rather than using legacy data. Um, third was engaging communities from whom the data was collected from. Um, so this would either be direct descendants or descendant communities. And then also importantly, educating ourselves about how the collections were collected and um, how the communities themselves are perceiving the use of the, of the data currently. And then lastly, uh, having some funding support to see how legacy data was collected. Um, there are many different collections available um, and we wanted to ensure that um, someone looked at those. And that's all we have. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the next group, group 13. Okay, and that is Alice Popejoy. Wonderful, thank you, Lucia. So we sort of addressed two categories of recommendations, one being sort of when is it appropriate to change uh, population descriptor labels on existing data sets? And then if that's determined to be appropriate, then how might we do that? So our first recommendation, thanks to all the group members who participated in this, it's kind of a summary of all the things that, that were discussed and came up to the top. So the overarching recommendation one is to clearly define what we mean by the terms we're using and how they were generated, both for the existing or legacy labels and for the new labels that they're changed to or added. Um, to develop consensus around those definitions, identify appropriate individuals or communities to engage in the process before making those decisions, and of course to privilege the perspectives of the original participants. Um, also, there were some comments about making sure that we're deciding which federal level guidance to follow if um, needed for reporting purposes. So the second overarching recommendation is to represent the most amount of information possible while avoiding creating confusion or harm by changing labels. So this is dropping labels that obscure important information, cause harm or stigmatization, and consider changing labels to more appropriate terms. For example, Caucasian, we might consider changing to white um, under some circumstances, maybe not in others, so it's up, up for debate, uh, context specific. Um, we talked about addressing the more than one category and the other categories in the demographic table. Um, so if there's more detailed information that's being obscured by these labels, then um, we might, might want to use those. And also there's a need to develop methods to better represent uh, intersectional identities and, and multiple labels that if you're, if, you're, if you're changing something that you use both what the original label was and you're not losing that information about that when you're adding a new label or changing it. Um, the recommendation or the example was to consider ways of including the number of generations since immigration to the US and adding that as a layer of information we might want to collect and overall that there's a need to respect people's self identification without reinforcing incorrect or outdated notions. Um, so, for example, we're not creating or changing labels in ways that conflate or are using inference to conflate genetics with self identification and of course to balance these recommendations with considerations of statistical significance. Great, thank you. And then let's see our last, our last, but our last group, but definitely not least, is um, group fourteen. Yes, uh, thank Abitello. you. Yes, thank you so much. We had a great conversation and a great note taker, Christina, as well. So we have three main recommendations. One is to have community involvement from the beginning to end. Obviously, the community engaged. Uh, studies are on the rise. Um, here, the idea was to have either an advisory committee on a, nas on a national or, or institutional level that will have uh, discussions about categorization and descriptors, but also the possibility of doing it by studies, uh, with the idea of coming to a decision within each population about first, second level preferences for, de for descriptions, the descriptors. That is, a first pr preference that would be ideally the one that will be used forever, but if 
that would not be uh, possible due to, again, collapse need for collapsing of data in the future, then the community should come up with some suggestions for second and th third le level preferences of descriptors for secondary users in the future. Um, so that was the first recommendation. The second recommendation was to um, for secondary data users to uh, for them to be informed very clearly about how discussion, discussions were made and decisions were made about the descriptors, uh, as well as to create data sheets for data sets so they can be informed about it um, and, um, and, and learn. Again, it could be also through publications, which we heard already from a few other groups, so we're not going to repeat that, but also, again, the data sheets as an option, um, as well as recommendations to have some MOUs in place to require researchers to follow those preferences. Um, or at least, again, if you can't have those the first preference, then go to the second or third level preference of descriptors as determined by the community that was invited to participate in the study to begin with. Or, I, or if that is also not possible to create a proxy groups to decide about data collapsing, uh, the proxy groups in this context should resemble as much as possible the original population that was studied. And then for future for existing data sets, uh, we thought that um, again there's a need to, to use proxy groups depending on the desired outcome of the population or the population. Uh, but also here there's an expectation to use um, proxy groups that are as close as possible to the original group that was uh, invited to participate in the study. And in any case, there is a requirement, again, that if there is deviation from the preferred terminologies and descriptors, that it needs to be transparent and that um, researchers have to provide scientific justification for that collapsing. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um so thank you to all the breakout group moderators, the note takers, and everyone who participated. Um, I will just offer, I think this is a remarkable set of recommendations. I, I've been to a lot of these kinds of workshops and many of them are, you know, are not as introspective and I think are oftentimes um, directed towards other people, but I think in the spirit of being intentional about our study designs and our analyses, and um, I think as someone, uh, Dr. Otimi mentioned, you know, kind of holding ourselves accountable. I, I definitely think a lot of these recommendations were in that spirit. So thank you all for your thoughtfulness. Um, we do have, I think, about eight minutes or so until um, the next kind of um, coming to a close session. So does, does anyone want to amplify um, any of the recommendations? I'm also seeing a chat. I'm sorry, I've been sort of moderating the slides, so I haven't been able to catch up with the chat, but is there... Um, a thread from the chat that someone would like to chime in about. I'm seeing some comments about um, talking about um, limitations of, maybe not limitations, I'm sorry. So I, I, um, AJ, I'm, I'm looking at your um, thread here and, and wondering if maybe you might wanna amplify a little bit more what's in the chat. I don't remember what I said in that chat. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not. I apologize if I'm putting you on the spot. I just thought there was, there seemed to be some lively discussion um, about something about a, a write-up and then having something in, in the in the introduction or the beginning of the methods. I'm not sure if anyone else oh, who's coming okay. in on Sorry. the thread I would like to, to comment. A, I went to get an empanada and I was only focused on my food. What we were talking about was when you actually, so I disagreed with the recommendation that you should talk about the population diversity or talk about what diversity you were striving for if you're doing a paper based on it. I said that that will incentivize people to do what some of them are already doing, not reporting the diversity of the sample to begin with by adding an extra section they have to do. I think everyone should mandatorily have to address diversity in their samples in the paper, and I don't want it buried in the limitations where they say, oh, by the way, this was 96% people racialized as white. I want it in the introduction or in the methods that explains why this population that might be more advantaged, might not have had all these different exposures, would be the ideal population to explore this particular research question. That should be justified. Got it. I think so. So, I, so if I understand what you're saying, it's kind of um, transparency about the alignment of the population with the scientific question. I think you said it. I think you said it really well. Um, okay. Are there any other um, questions? Let me just quickly skim through the chat. 
Oh, can I make it? Can I make a comment? Yes. Let's go ahead. Yeah, and I, I see Rayanne has put something very much the same. That like a lot of the things seem to um, kind of recapitulate a lot of the stuff that was in the NASAM report. Uh, all really fabulous stuff. And so I'm wondering, if, but there, there were also like new things which rise, which rise to the surface. And I'm, one, I'm wondering if you can tell us anything about the process from here in terms of digesting all of the things that have come up and, you know, distinguishing from the NASAM report, et cetera. Yeah, I do think there's a lot to process. So, um, and and I, any of my NIH um, colleagues should feel free to chime in because we're we're all working together. But what we're hoping to do is share the output of this workshop with our respective institute centers and offices. So, I mean, I I think what I'd love for us to do is to think about you know, obviously what NIH can do, and and those of us um, at our institutes. Like for 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 me, it'll be what NHGRI can do in this space. I think continuing to convene. Um, our institute partners and figuring out if there are, you know, for example, funding opportunities or examples of policies or um, additional guidance that we can make clearer for the community. Um, that would be really helpful. I mean, I think you all, you all have given us a pretty wide landscape of recommendations to consider. So I think um, partnerships are going to be relevant as well with, with the scientific community, with I think journal editors came up a couple of times. So I, I think what we've heard builds obviously builds very well on the NASM recommendations because that's how we sort of designed the workshops. But there's a whole ecosystem that I think exists outside of the recommendations as well that um, that that we're all sort of part of. And, and I think, you know, we, we at NIH will think about our respective roles in, in moving this discussion forward. Any other comments or questions? Lucia, I um, had a question in the um in the QA. I can just raise Oh, oh I'm sorry. I yeah, I'm sorry. I realized I forgot to look at the QA. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no worries. Um, it's just the, the the recommendation that um inappropriate inclusion of data. For example, legacy labels were con collected under different socio-cultural contexts should outweigh the need for a larger sample size. So I just want, and, and that came up earlier as well, that there might be times when it, it's better to not include data than um, to include it when it's inappropriately labeled. But I just wanted to be clear, are we saying that that data should not be used at all? I, or are we saying that it should be used, but without that label? For example, the underlying genotypes are still usable. Um, but it, it's just the label that shouldn't be used because I think that's probably that's probably an important distinction to make. Gina, it looks like that might have come up in your breakout group session. Do you do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I think obviously um, some of this is going to be um, what's discussed tomorrow, which is you know types of studies and when when labels matter more and when they don't. Um, but I, I think that um, where we came to was that if the label needs, if the kind of the label, if what is the label is trying to get across needs to be used to answer a research question and it's not the right label, um, don't use it. Don't use that data set use the data set for something else, but not for that particular study. Right, that, that's clear, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll give uh, Ian the last question here, the comment from the Q&A. Um, would you like to state that in person? I think everyone can sort of see it, but if you wanna amplify. Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, a con our breakout group seemed a little crestfallen, um, you know, that that the recommendations we had for meta analysis and a lot of the NASM recommendations sort of amount to, you know, you need to be thoughtful about this, which is true. But as an analyst, and I think a lot of analysts would would appreciate, you know, clear guidelines and do's and don'ts, which I think NASA, the NASM report did a good job of providing. But uh I think we all acknowledge there's not this one size fits all approach to a lot of these analyses. And I'm just curious what folks thoughts are on how do we educate and hold analysts accountable in this space when we can't necessarily give them very clear guidelines. So does anyone want to 
did, did that come up in anyone's breakout groups or do you want to, anyone want to answer that? I'll, I'll, I don't know if it, if one of the group leaders wants to answer that by all means do so. But I think that my, in my experience, I think it's important that analysts um, work with people who are analysts, who are actually experts in the populations. I mean, whether it be directly with the community, and, and sometimes that means moving outside of your your bubble of comfort, right? I mean, I've had conversations at the New York Genome Center with our computational scientists about you know, how we might interpret some of the social determinants labels that come from e EHR in the context of genomics. And it's easy to sit behind our computers and just link up to GIS data, right? Like, you know, that's sort of the analyst approach, like where where is more data? Let's just link more data, right? But I think sometimes the data don't necessarily capture the context. And so, when you are doing this type of work, I think one of the take homes should be you may have to move outside of what is typically a standard workflow that you may have to consult. You may have to reapprise what you're doing, the purpose of what you're doing, and certainly make sure that you keep that in the forefront because, you know, data are data and it's easy to remove oneself from the outcome being an impact on a group of people, but I think we need to keep that centered, you know, in our approach. So that was, that would be my clumsy way of approaching it, but <laughs> happy to hear all these comments. Thank you, if, uh, Melissa. Oh, sorry, was if, someone about if, to chime in? Oh, I was Audrey um, okay. from University of Colorado. If in our team, it, there was a lot of discussion about um, reproducibility, providing your code, perhaps providing the reference data that you're using, just, you know, having transparency going forward. So while that doesn't help necessarily analysts, I think that it could give better guidance for everybody moving forward. And at least we would know what was done previously um, to help uh evaluate and and maybe advise for the future. And Audrey, to your point, I think, you know, as as in our individual groups, we implement these best practices. The hope is that that percolates into the literature and sort of people new to the space and new to analysis in this space are hopefully it's easier for them to access and see the right way to go about this or better ways to go about this. Okay, I'm realizing we need to wrap up our discussion to a close. Um, lots of engagement in the chat. I think it's been really interesting to sort of see how the different threats have um, kind of um, gotten discussed. But I am going to turn it over to our co-chairs, uh, Melissa and Malia, to um, close this out for day one. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Lucia. Melissa, do we have a plan here? I don't think we do. <laughs> well, you know, I think that it's been a great day. I mean, I, I yeah. certainly have fully appreciated the breadth of the comments. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you to all the participants. I mean, I'm very encouraged, first of all, that you all are participating and being very active yes. in the discussion. I think that is the best way forward in order for us to really understand a moving target, you know, which is guidelines across populations in the context in which, you know, research is being done. So first of all, congratulations to all of you for being here and being present and being active. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have some key, you know, I guess, key quotes, if you will, of the day. I don't mm -hmm. know, Molly, if you want to go first, if you have any comments. You know, um, I, um, I, I just, I, I share your gratitude for everyone's active participation. I think this is um, clearly, uh, I agree with Lucia. These were really some remarkable recommendations. And, and Ian, before we get too discouraged that this just feels like it's sort of more of the same, you know, and just more of what we've already heard from the, from the multi-year process that was the NASM uh, consensus committee, um, I do think that we're actively uh, thinking about some new areas here, and we have a whole other half day to kind of consolidate our thinking and, and get to some
some uh, consolidation of recommendations. So let us let us not get too discouraged at this point. And yes, thank you all for your your active participation, um, Melissa. Since you've got some key comments or key quotes that you want to, yeah. I, I didn't take those kind of notes. I will just say this educational piece that we sort of ended on is something that has come up over and over again in other discussions that I have been a part of. And um, and I think it's sort of interesting because legacy data sets might be the first port of call for graduate students and trainees, um, right, who don't have access to their own uh, sources of data. And yet they are perhaps the least well positioned to be thoughtful and critical here. So the role for mentorship um, and transdisciplinarity, uh, kudos to all of you who've been calling for transdisciplinarity and working actively in collaboration. I think that will be key in also teaching our, our young folks how to do that well. Thank you all. Uh, Melissa, please. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, I totally agree. I mean, I'm trained as a genomicist, but as of late, I've started working, <laughs> working very closely with uh, epidemiologists to help me understand, you know, the social context and the complexities and lived experiences. And it actually brings a lot of clarity to the to the purpose of what we're doing. And so I, I jumped in and out of a few of the breakout sections. And one of the things that I heard repeatedly was that people were kind of confused about what harmonization means, you know, how what harmonizing what, you know. And so from a data perspective, harmonizing is a very mathematical thing, whereas when we're talking about groups of people and populations, harmonizing could actually come across as being, well, um, over intrusive in terms of how people like, identify themselves. And so I think it's important that we um, think about that when we have mandates that are driving that inappropriate collapse, because we're getting mixed signals, right? I heard, you know, describing a population versus diversifying a study, right? We, in order to diversify, you have to actually know that you have diversity, which then speaks to differences. But then we don't want to draw too fine a demarcation and, you know, describe a population in, um, in terms other than genetic similarity. So we can't be all similar, but yet be different. But can we, you know, so it's sort of, this nuanced thinking, right, where, again, that's why I think of it as a moving target, because the reality is, depending on what you're doing, and I, I'll always come back to that, what you're doing, the purpose of your research, I think it's going to be really important to consider then how you um, how you handle your data. And then I guess the last thing I would say is, and I'm going to use this, <laughs> um, but um, become competent in the descriptor. So, you know, instead of someone telling you, well, this is what you use for this group of people and this is what you use for that group of people. And even I think, you know, without going back to the community and say, well, how do you define yourselves today? You know, sometimes you don't have that luxury. I think you have to actually understand the provenance of how descriptors are, you know, um, created. And then in that context, you may actually, again, discover something about the geography or the rurality or, you know, the social structures that are, you know, um, maybe inflection points that that could be very important in your interpretation of the findings when you're, you know, analyzing genomic data. So those are my take homes and I'm going to make a cheat sheet <laughs> to make sure I take this back to my team. In fact, so thank you all. Thank you again. It's going to be an exciting day tomorrow. <laughs> Please come back. Well, Lucia, Janela, any last comments? Yeah, okay. any um, closing remarks to get us ready for tomorrow or? Well, thank you all very much for participating. Thank you to our co-chairs for the fantastic work of leading and summarizing and encouraging us. Thank you all for participating. We do have day tomorrow starting at 11 a.m eastern and we have more talks and we have more breakout groups um and so we really look forward to um everybody coming back and giving us additional recommendations additional thinking and we will see you tomorrow <laughs>